Well, these essays are known to us, uh, regularly published by the uh, Mises Institute uh, and various other uh, think tanks and, and, and does very valuable work. So what I thought we'd do, the point of this presentation tonight, this paper, um, is to give us a little bit of a handle on how we could take forward hard currency, get back to hard currency. I think you've only got to look at history to see uh, the terrible problems that we have when we move away from uh, the reliability of currency. We've seen it in the Roman Empire, we saw it in the Tudor period, uh, and uh, we're now seeing it, uh, we've seen it in the 20th century, we're now seeing it again, uh, we're seeing it again today. It isn't really viable for central banks and governments to continue to print money uh, without debasing basically the coin of the realm and over the years it's been done in many different ways taking the gold out of the coinage, taking the silver out of the coinage. There's all sorts of clever ways that governments steal your money, uh, and we're going through that phase now. Um, I think what we need to look at is, where is it likely that we have a hard currency, where we might go back to hard currency, where there's a political will? And I would argue that perhaps that is Germany. There seems to be a uh, feeling uh, in Germany, from so far as we can judge, uh, that they never really wanted to relinquish the Deutsche Mark. Uh, they understand the benefits of our currency, and so that is our first call of call um, to, have, uh, to go back to hard currency. Uh, and they could leave the world, and we could go back to the state where we have a benchmark for other fiat currencies, and we would hope that other type of currencies would follow the lead, uh, even if they didn't uh, pay necessarily to uh, the Deutsche Mark, and you were hard commodity back to Deutsche Mark. Uh, it might set the rest of the uh, free world back on uh, a stable currency base. Uh, so that's the whole point uh, of, of the idea, and that's the point of the concept. Um, it's always easy to throw a concept out, it's very much more difficult to show how it might be implemented, uh, but that's where Professor Barrett comes in. Uh, I think you'll find it a very interesting paper. We've been looking at these doctrines for some time. Uh, we're hoping to get together with Philip Davis, of course, who you all know. Uh, who's another very significant expert in this field, with a view to presenting this in Berlin uh, in the next month or two, uh, to try and set up a debate, let's set up a discussion. Uh, I, know, um, I know Professor Barron is very keen to take any questions that you might have after he's, uh, he's delivered the paper. So, uh, so pin your ears back, ladies uh, and gentlemen, and uh, over to Pat. Thank you, Patrick. Well, I'm delivering a short paper, um, and I, I am going to just read it. I've written it up very carefully, so I want to make sure that I impart to you, you know, exactly what I'd like to say. But then I think that the um, Godfrey and I both can answer questions and, and hear your comments about what we have to say. So the title of this is uh, Modestly Stated, The Solution to the Worldwide Debt Crisis. It's very modestly stated. Uh, the Eurozone debt crisis is the logical and inevitable result of a worldwide delusion that central bank credit expansion is a cure for debt and that it will st stimulate economies to higher levels of prosperity, out of which ever increasing welfare entitlements may be taken. The truth is that credit expansion is the cause of the current debt crisis and all of its ancillary evils, which include high unemployment, a lower standard of living, and the threat of civil unrest. Central banks have distorted the market mechanism in which the interest rate brings the savings of real resources by real people into harmony with the credit demands of business and industry creating a sustainable economic process. It is replaced by phony liquidity, which encourages investments in longer-term projects, which eventually will be abandoned due to the lack of resources with which to complete. The Euro project, which is based upon this delusion of the benefits of unlimited credit expansion, has created a moral hazard monster whereby risk and profligacy are encouraged and prudence and thrift are punished and vilified. 
the EMU is a multinational tragedy of the commons, a well-known economic term that describes the disastrous consequences that follow from a failure to secure property rights in order to protect a commonly held resource from being plundered to extinction. The commonly held resource is the euro itself. The misconstruction of the EMU rewards high sovereign state deficits with cheap euros, created out of thin air and in unlimited quantities by the ECB. This is the tragic mechanism through which moral hazard is institutionalized in Europe. Moral hazard brought forth by lower borrowing costs is the logical result of the implicit and often explicitly stated promise that the EMU would prevent sovereign debt default by any EMU member. The result was an orgy of speculative lending and extensions of welfare state benefits. Instead of funding sound, profitable, productive investments, the profits of which would amortize and extinguish the debt incurred, this credit expansion funded speculative loans to overbuilt industries and increased welfare entitlements. There are no profits from which debt can be amortized and eventually extinct. On the contrary, both speculative lending and welfare benefits can be sustained only by even more debt or higher taxes. There are natural limits to both. And as the wise man once said, that which cannot continue will not continue. He also pointed out that reality is not optional. We must look upon the world the way it really is. It may seem as if every nation in the world subscribes to the more credit solution to our current crisis, but this is not so. In fact, there is one nation, and it belongs to the EMU, that has objected to the EMU's credit expansion policies from the very beginning. This nation's representatives on the ECB board have resigned in protest to EMU policy and voted against ECB bailouts of sovereign debt with fiat euro credit expansion. This nation is one of the great trading and exporting nations of the world and a nation with the second largest gold supply in the world upon which it could base sound gold-backed money of its own. Furthermore, 90 years ago to this year, this nation experienced the disastrous consequences of the very policies currently pursued by the EMU. And this country alone in the EMU has balanced its government books. This country, of course, is Germany. Germany's capital, its accumulated wealth, is being plundered via this Euro credit extension process that justifies itself in regulation, law, and treaty. Its effects are delayed and for a while obscure, so that cause and effect are not immediately seen. It takes time for this money created out of thin air to work its way from initial creation to having the effect of diluting the savings of productive people, causing price inflation and ruining the purchasing power of the euro. This monetary dilution makes the entire Euro monetary system weak. Because of the inherent time delay, most observers fail to see this cause and effect. But it is there. It is always there. Even some who do understand the effect on Germany, which includes many prominent Germans themselves, justify the plunder out of a false sense of European brotherhood, or even worse, a lingering <coughs> sense of German war guilt. But all this is false. There is no benefit to Germany's European brothers that would accrue from the destruction of Germany's capital base. This is a political cult born of the delusion that fiat euro credit is beneficial and limitless. But there is always a limit. Reality is not optional. Europe's prosperity and its very survival as a free and democratic continent 
depend upon German industry. As Germany goes, so goes Europe. And as Europe goes, so goes America, and ultimately the world. At this crucial point in history, which is ruled by great delusions, the entire edifice of Western liberty hinges on Germany. The solution to the Euro debt crisis, and also the worldwide debt crisis, is for Germany to leave the EMU, re-establish the Deutsche Mark, and tie the Deutsche Mark to gold. These actions are the right of Germany as a sovereign nation, and are non-coercive in that no other nation is forced by Germany to take any specific action. If Ludwig Erhard could do it in 1948, under even more dire political conditions as existed at the time, then Wolfgang Schauble and Jim Wiedemann can do it today. The beneficial consequences of reinstating sound money in Germany can hardly be overstated. The fiat money house of cards depends upon there being no better alternative money for international trade. By reinstating the Deutschmark, and backing it with gold, international traders would migrate to the Deutsche Mark as their currency of choice and away from dollars, yen, euros, and yuan. Demand for the Deutsche Mark would rise, causing German productive costs to fall and German industry to become even more competitive. The only way for the rest of the world to prevent flight from their currencies to the Deutsche Mark would be for them to emulate Germany's example. That is, stop inflating their currencies and tie them to their own gold reserves. I hope you can see that this one non-coercive, peaceful act by a sovereign Germany has the power to change the way the international monetary system works. Rather than each central bank trying to weaken its currency against all others, it will be forced by the market to strengthen its currency, or experience inflation and loss of industrial competitiveness. The destructive cycle of money debasement will be replaced by a virtuous cycle of money improvement, all directed by market forces and rational self-interest alone. We call upon German patriots to explain this to their countrymen. Germany must leave the EMU and reinstate a golden Deutschland. The world teeters on the brink of monetary collapse, the consequences of which undoubtedly will be massive poverty and possibly revolution and war. Germany can save itself, save Europe, and save the world simply by exercising its right as a sovereign country to control its own currency. It will set an example for the world to follow. And follow, I'm sure it will. Thank you. Questions? Um, I'm like this. I'm like a Joyce. I'm a local property. Um, I'm very, well, I have so many questions, but um, a couple. Um, do you advocate the international gold standard so only central banks will be expected to transact or the personal gold standard so individuals will be able to go into the, the branches of the banks and get? Gold, if they want, to, I'm looking at stockings, which I can't case so much. Yeah. And uh, and so that that to me is the, the truest gold standard. And the second question, if I can have two, on the trot is um, Germany trying to get their gold back from the US or some other, and they're having trouble. So I think that's what's cool. Well, those are excellent uh, comments, really, and questions. Godfrey and I support absolute freedom of money. Um, we see the uh, re-establishment of Germany, re-establishing the Deutschmark, and then we see that as setting up a peaceful, non-coercive cascade of virtuous acts by similar governments in order to remain competitive. But what the, what the world really should go to is getting government completely out of the business of, of managing money. Money should be, people should be allowed to use whatever money they want. If people want to use euros, Deutschmarks, or if um, HSBC Bank wants to issue its own currency, there's no reason that we see that governments have to get involved in managing those at all. The market process can manage those. 
very well. But this is this is a long process. And the first the first step is the most difficult one, and that first step would be for Germany as a very important world exporting nation, and it's the fourth largest um, as the first fourth largest economy in the world, and the second largest gold reserve in the world, for it to reestablish its own Deutschmark, which when it was managing its own currency, Germany was by far the least inflationary uh, country in the world. Its central bank was the most responsible of all the central banks, including the Federal Reserve. By far, it was the most responsible. But even the Deutsche Bank is run by people, is run by man, and there is always the incentive to to uh, debase your currency for political reasons. That's why the ultimate guarantee to the people, and I think we have to remember that this is for the benefit, not of governments, but of people everywhere. The ultimate benefit to the people is that they be allowed to use whatever currency they wish. If they are allowed to use whichever currency they wish, then it will be the incentive of the market and people who, who manage currencies to make them stronger and stronger. So that you can you can go to either an office of the Federal Reserve or an office of the Deutsche Bank or an office of HSBC Bank and turn in your pieces of paper or write a check against your current account and say, give me my gold and turn it over to you. That is the ultimate, that is the ultimate goal. Because ultimately, it's not these pieces of paper that we carry around that are money. The money is the monetary medium, is the is the commodity, gold, silver, to the other things. Gold is, from time immemorial, gold has been the preeminent money along with silver. This is really money. The pieces of paper that we carry around were called certificates. And they were called certificates for a good reason. They certified that this piece of paper represented a certain quantity of gold that was held in some safe place for them to redeem upon demand. This is the this is the, the the world that we must return to. Did I, is there any, did I answer the question? Uh, yes, uh, but the second part is Germany. Uh, if you haven't, if I've got my gold, I'm not sure if I can count it. But Germany haven't got their gold, so they're trying to be repatriated. Right. right. Um, Godfrey have written and I have written a joint article in which we we recommend that uh, Germany has recently. Uh, Stated that it will repatriate about 15% of its gold that's held overseas. We recommend that Germany repatriate all of it and as do as fast as it can. I mean, there's no reason that Germany should have most of its gold stored in the United States. It may want to keep some gold in the United States and some gold in, in London for trading purposes, but some small amount only for trading purposes. But it's important that the world know that. that the currency issuer that has its currency backed by gold, that it actually has the gold. It should allow free audits of its gold reserves periodically so that the whole world can see that the gold actually is there. And and this is an important thing because if you don't know that the gold's there, then, then it violates the whole process of what money really is. So Germany should demand to get its gold back its right. It's its gold, and it should demand it, its gold back and put it in its own vaults in Germany. Yeah, I think I'd go, uh, I'd, I'd just go further on that. It, you know, it has to be audited. I'd like to see, I'd like to see an audit. I think one of the problems we have in the volatility that we've seen in gold uh, in the last year or two uh, is that it's paper trading, it's ETFs and so on and so forth that are actually being traded. So the certificates that are implying that gold is being held. Uh, some of the investment banks are selling it short, so they're doing what is called naked short selling, uh, which means that they're selling gold that they don't have, and they're just selling they're selling certificates. Now, I would argue, and I don't know, but it's only a, it's only an opinion. Uh, but if one wonders uh, if the, for every certificate that has been issued uh, by any deposit or supposed deposit holder of the gold, whether they actually have that gold. Uh, and I suspect that perhaps that isn't the case. Uh, and I think what we'll find is that uh, if you want delivery of gold, if you want the delivery of, of gold bullion, 
uh, you'll find that it isn't quite so easy to come by. And you know that the Chinese are now buying gold, that the Chinese people are buying gold, so the actual physical commodity. And I would, I would suggest that we only need one failure to deliver this gold. If somebody defaults on the delivery of gold, so if some bank or some depositor has, has on your behalf, said that they have, they're holding for you a hundred troy ounces of gold, uh, and you both turn up at the same time, and you're both holding the same certificate, like two women in the same hat at Ascot, uh, it's going to be significantly troublesome, I rather fancy. Uh, and I think that day could come tomorrow, and that day might not come for uh, a few years. But certainly the confidence in gold, you must hold your gold, uh, otherwise uh, there's no point in having it. A promise of gold by a politician or a central banker is, of course, totally worthless. <laughs> I am the person from Book New York. Um, yeah, I very much agree with pretty much everything you said. Uh, I only want to add that um, when Germany would go to the gold sand, uh, they would default. They would even default because the real German debt is three to four times as big as the official debt on the books. If you look at the implicit um, liabilities, all the pension promises they've made. So I think. Um, while it's a right to call for a gold standard, we have to be honest, I have to say that this also means um, abolishing social security, um, or at least privatizing it. Uh, so, so I think um, that would be a good thing uh, for, um, for, for any country to do, uh, to have a more liberal social system. But um, when we call for a gold standard, I think we have to be honest and make that clear. Um, with regard to fixing the debt system, therefore, I think that uh, more realistically, if only Germany would go back to their um, second best system of fraudulent fiat money, Deutsche Mark, it would be a lot better already than the current euro, which provides for a lot more money printing and uh, debasing, um, uh, debasing the currency. And I think another important advantage of it uh, that is not often mentioned is um, when you look at it, from a geostrategical standpoint in Europe, um, I think at a certain point we will witness the, um, the countries in South Europe, France, Italy, perhaps asking Germany to leave because this would uh, mean that their currency will effectively devalue it so they finally will see more, um, more economic growth. And um, I think the other case of going back to the Deutsche Mark should make that more clear that this is actually to keep the peace and it's in the interest of France of, of Italy and um, continuing with the Euro as we can see is uh, leading to strains between France and Europe and the conflict. Yes, well, thank you Peter. Yeah, I read the whole of Europe every day. So, uh, in fact, I've learned most of what I know about what's going on very much in Europe. I just would have to say that um, we really, it's hard to predict what the consequences would be of returning to sound money. Um, we're not saying that this is an easy thing to do. I've, I've watched conferences, attended conferences, where some will say, well, I've got a plan, and I, at a stroke of a pen, we eliminate the debt, but that's not really the quality, and uh, there's no pain involved. Well, going back to sound money means that we, we see reality the way it really is. We see the tremendous burden that our governments have imposed upon future generations by, fiat, by their ability to print money in unlimited amounts. And this is, frankly, in my opinion, this is financial criminality. And it's got to stop. But we have to stop, because the longer we go, the worse it gets. So there's really no, in my opinion, there's really no option. We either stop it, and the sooner we stop it, the better, or eventually, the entire monetary system collapses for the very reason, Peter, that you're mentioning is if you look behind the numbers, which very few people do, it is completely unsustainable. The American Social Security system is bankrupt. It's completely unsustainable. The only reason it keeps going along is by coercion of the federal government and its ability to print an extra $1 trillion every year. It prints $1 trillion every year. Keep in mind that the M1, which is the narrowest 
measure of the monetary supply in the United States is $2.4 trillion. They're printing $1 trillion of new money every year in the United States. This cannot continue. It will eventually, at some point, reality will assert itself. So this has just got, this has got to happen. But I won't say that, that, that it will not, that it will be an easy transition, but it's something that we have to do. Um, and one of the reasons, of course, that governments don't want to amend the current system is because they want to continue to buy votes with the fiat money by promising people wealth, welfare that they really cannot afford, that the future generations really cannot afford to provide them, because they eventually have to, have to provide real resources to people. You have to provide real medical care to the, to the expanding elderly population, not pieces of paper. You know, you have to say, you know, there are plenty of nurses and drugs and, and hospitals and things like that for the elderly, not just, well, I'm just going to pretend that it's all there and I'm giving you a piece of paper and I'm going to, I'm going to say you have a quote in type of which is concept, the term that I really despise. Stuart, uh, thank you. I'm one of the colleagues here. Uh, two rather sort of trite questions which you might get, but I hope they all be exercised, and then something on the more personal nature. All right, there's enough gold in the world for Germany to have a gold standard. Is there enough gold in the world for the world to have a gold standard? That's the first question. The second is, if Germany leaves the euro and goes to Deutschmark, its currency will become very, very strong. Normally when that happens, exporters find it very, very difficult to sell their goods, and the tourist destinations within that country find that people just don't want to go there because their currency is by so few Deutsche marks. So is it really such a good deal for Germany to do that? On a personal level, I borrowed nearly a million pounds from the bank for the poultry unit. That's, they lent me money they didn't have. If they are suddenly required to have gold to back all the lending that they've done, what will they do about my loan? Will they recall it? Is it void? What actually happens in that circumstance? Well, there's a, there is a lot that you, you can mention here. First of all, any amount of gold is sufficient to run the entire world's monetary system. It's strictly a ratio of the monetary unit within the, this country to the gold reserves that it holds. So it's just a ratio. Uh, you know, in the beginning of the 20th century, in the United States, it was a, a ratio of 20 and a half dollars to an ounce of gold. And I believe in Great Britain, it was uh, five pounds or 4.86 pounds to an ounce of gold. Uh, that ratio can be whatever it has to be. That ratio today would be very, very large, even in, in the United States. So let's keep this in mind. In, 19, in the early 1930s, before FDR took us off the gold standard during the 19th, confiscated the gold of the, of the Americans, which I consider to be the greatest step in all history. Uh, it was twenty and a half dollars to an ounce of gold. He he later depreciated that to uh, thirty-five dollars to an ounce of gold. Thirty-five dollars to an ounce of gold uh, up until tonight to all until August 15th of 1971. Central banks around the world could present. $35 to the Federal Reserve Bank in, in America and get an ounce of gold. Today, that ratio, using M1, this, the narrowest measure of money in the United States, would be close to $8,000 to an ounce of gold. And if we use M2, which is a larger measure, which includes, in my opinion, is the proper measure, which includes M1 plus short-term instantly redeemable savings accounts, which I can transfer from my savings account in my bank to my checking account with a click of a mouse on my computer, it would be almost $40,000 to an ounce of gold. Now, this does not say that it can't be done. This just shows you the extent to which the monetary medium has been debased since 1971. From $35 an ounce in 1971 to $40,000 for M2 today. That would be so that people could redeem M2 and the United States would have enough gold in which to, to give them. But that's why it has, to, if we don't stop that, I mean, when I first started keeping these statistics, it was $5,000 an ounce. Now it's up to almost 8000 
for M1. I mean, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And with with the gov with our with our government, bar or printing one trillion dollars a year, it's just going to become astronomical. So it it will be it will be a case of there there is enough gold because it's just it's a ratio. But we make the ratio may be very large. You know, my dollar may represent one forty one forty thousand of an ounce of gold. But that's just the way it is. That's reality. That is real, and that's what we have to. So we have to we have to remember that gold is is a is a discipline, and it's it's really the discipline not only on all all of us individuals. It's, a, it's mainly a discipline on government, so the government doesn't get us into this terrible situation that it has gotten us into. So where it's just printing money, borrowing, promising. No, when you have a gold standard, the government has to go to the people for the money. And we get to say that we run our, one of our taxes rates. Or, if we say, no, we don't want to raise our taxes, and we want to spend a lot of money, then they have to go to the bond market. Well, the bond market might lend the United States money, but eventually, the bond market will lend the United States money. I, I, I would probably say today that if in a sound money environment, there would be very little lending to sovereign governments because probably they're all they're all bankrupt. I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. There's no going back. All we can do is stop the rot from going forward. Now, as as for your your loan, um, you know, when you know, there's a Joke in the United States, I think it was William F. Buckley said, you know, when when uh, I owe my bank uh, $10,000, I have a problem. When I owe my bank $10 million, the bank has a problem. <laughs> you know, are you going to be able to repay your loan? Uh, under sound money, the, United, the whole world would go through probably several years of a wrenching recession. There will, there will be no there will be no getting around the recession. There's no getting around the recession at all. Once the credit expansion has kicked off, and we have what the Austrian economists call malinvestment, meaning we're investing in things we cannot complete, you know, we cannot deliver. Once that has started, the only solution is to stop the credit expansion and accept the fact that the market is going to tell us what cannot be completed, and that's what's called a recession. But the recession is the cure. We have to go through this recession. The longer we continue to print money, the worse it's going to be and the longer it's going to last. But it's something we just have to do. I don't see any alternative to it. I wish we, we're living we're living you know, we're living in a in a Keynesian delusion. <coughs> Printing money with the click of a mouse somehow makes us all rich and we can promise everyone everything. I'm sorry, that just isn't the way the world works. Hi, my name is Manino. First officer for UK, uh, the UK, the for the government. Uh, yeah, I have a good question that Stuart asked very capably. I was going to ask the exact same question. That if, uh, according to your proposal, if Germany left the euro and uh, took up the Deutschmark back by gold, Surely it uh, would become a very hard currency. Demand for it would uh, increase. Uh, it would go very high in foreign exchange in comparison to other currencies. Uh, the cost of its exports would rise very, very highly. That means it would be very difficult for Germany to export its goods on which it relies for what? Well, for exports of. Uh, Sure. Sure. Uh, uh, it's for tourism as well. So, how would Germany be able to cope with that? Okay. You're right. Perhaps that's a very important part of the question. Well, first of all, Germany's export industry is larger than it would be under a sound money system. Because what's happening right now is through the European Central Bank, uh, the European Central Bank is printing euros giving it to countries that will never repay those euros so that they can buy German products. So in effect, Germany is producing Mercedes and BMWs and, and wonderful electronic, electrical equipment and heavy industries 
and other countries are buying these things with pieces of paper that are absolutely worthless. That is not a benefit to Germany. Now, Germany, I'm sure that if you are a worker in a German exporting country, you think this is the greatest thing in the world. This is why it's so difficult even in Germany to recognize reality because there are segments of the economy in Germany, the export industries, that see the, the debasement of their money as a benefit. All the world is doing this right now. See, this is what's happening. All the world it has gone crazy in trying to destroy their money so that they can become, uh, their, their money can become worth less than their, than their neighbors so they can export more. In other words, it's, it's a crazy idea if you think about it. I want to become a slave to my neighbor. I want to work and toil and build things and then he's going to give me little pieces of paper that are worth nothing. And I want to do that. Well, this is the delusion that this all this whole thing has encouraged over over decades now. That money is pieces of paper. Now that money is a click on a on a computer screen. No, money is a medium of exchange, and it has to have real value. So, first of all, Germany would become more competitive. And I'm not saying its export industries would not suffer. They probably would. But they, but Germany overall would become very competitive. The rest of the country. In effect, now the rest of the country is subsidizing the export industries in Germany. If you're not, if you're a German and you're not working in one of these big export industries, your your standard of living is falling. I just have a couple of points to that. There's, there's, there's two things. There's two two um, uh, two things to talk about. That. Firstly, uh, for anybody my age around the table, just only a couple of us, <laughs> um, will remember. The extraordinary advance uh, of the German automobile industry throughout the 1960s and 1970s, as the mark got stronger and stronger uh, against Sterling, uh, it did not stop the advance of uh, exports from Germany to this country. They just got better, they got better value for money. And in that case, you know, people were prepared to pay. So I don't buy, the history doesn't show. Okay, and I know a lot of people in this room would say, great. But I was actually trying to imagine it happening, on, you know, what happens in the first 24 hours. Well, I think the European, the European Mantra Union would have sent uh, and good riddance to it. It's been misconstructed, no. poorly designed. It's nothing but an engine of transferring wealth from Germany to the rest of Europe. That's all it is. Um, Germany was blackmailed or extorted into Germany, joining the monetary union it was about as close as we could get to that. Uh, they were told that they were, they were not going to be allowed to reunite their country under the fall of the Soviet Union unless they got rid of the Deutschland, which, which was a sort of a slap in the face to the rest of, of the continent of Europe in that the, the Deutschmark was continuously appreciating against the, the pound and the franc and the lira and the you know, the peso and the drachma, of course. So what were the Germans doing that was, that was right? Well, they were industrious and they weren't, and they weren't running budget deficits. They had control of their economy. It may not be the way we would, in America would run our economy, but it was working for them. You know. So, uh, the European Monetary Union would not survive if, if Germany was. But what might, what might replace it? I could, I could imagine that perhaps in the first 24 hours, several countries would declare themselves to be a Bush mark nation. Just turn in their euros and say, oh, we are perfectly happy to allow the Bundesbank to uh, to run our currency for us. So like Holland and Finland. Holland, Finland, yes. You know, the northern tier. You know, and then as time goes on, German, the Deutschmark as the preferred medium of exchange for international trade, you would find that the the people who are trade are exchanging their dollars for Deutschmark. So the Deutsche Mark in, in Germany, gold would start to flow to Germany to back the new printing of, of Deutsche Mark. And eventually, the rest of the world would have to emulate Germany's good example. You know, one of my, one of my favorite phrases that I've developed the last few years is, mind your own business instead of good example. That's all any of us have to do. That's all any nation has to do, which is mind its own business instead of good example. And that's all Germany does. My own so business and setting a good example how to run a monetary system. And eventually the rest of the world would have to emulate that. 
And we would, instead of going down this death spiral of destroying our currency, if we would start to see governments and they start to recognize reality and start to strengthen the currency. And we would start to get our liberty back. And we would start living within our means. Who's heard of that terrible <laughs> phrase in the last you know, while? You know, we all must live within our means or we must save ourselves for our old age. Oh no! They all the the generations behind me are going to take care of me in my old age. I must not save for myself. You know? Well, these are really just reputable, horrible uh, personal characteristics, I guess you'd say, that it are all the result of this fiat money that has been foisted upon the world. It, it goes beyond just finance. I mean, it goes it goes to how we even relate to one another. You know, the the following generations are being saddled with unbelievable debt. Unbelievable debt. Well, this is terrible. You know, this is creating a war within generations, which is completely unnecessary. Well, sir, thank you very much for your encouraging, uh, encouraging message. Um, and uh, let me start out uh, with a personal appeal. I have some of these pieces of paper which we promised to pay uh, yeah. written on them uh, in a little strong box under my bed. What should I do with uh, with such uh, small amounts of money as I may have managed to accumulate in a, uh, a long career? That's my first and personal question. My second question is, yeah, I love the theory, but we in Britain did have the experience, I'm sorry my history isn't good enough to quote the precise date, but we did, uh, or we were, on the gold standard, um, and I think it was Sir Winston Churchill when he was um, Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, was absolutely pig-headedly and obstinately determined that Britain should remain on the gold standard because he thought it was all part of patriotism and nationalism and all those things, and actually it was rather bad experience. Uh, when we dropped out of the gold standard, uh, if my memory serves, um, we did for a while rather better. Was it not a bit like dropping out of the ERM, and was that not quite a good thing, um, is my question. And, and uh, at the first point, I understand why you want to get away from fiat currency and attach your money to something that has a real value. But why gold? I mean, gold is just, okay, it's years and years of tradition, it's like going back into the Genesis or something. You know, it's rather nice, and we all feel good about it, and we read books and, and the pots of gold. But why not platinum? Why not oil? Why not some other uh, widely available commodity? Well, we, you go. I think, frankly, there can't be anything else that people want in a free monetary system. You can base your currency on anything. In fact, over over the millennium and over the history, there's a number of things that have been used as money. In America. Of bales of tobacco were really used for this money. You know, and receipts for bales of tobacco were transferred to, from person to person today as almost as we as we, you know, I'll buy a little, you know, five euros or five euros. You know, at that time it was, you know, a receipt for a bale of tobacco. So it doesn't have to be gold, except from time immemorial, it has been the most marketable commodity. And this is the key thing. The most marketable commodity will eventually surpass others. But in many, in, in many uh, societies, gold and silver have been um, alongside one another as long as you don't try to fix the exchange between those, you know, the thing of flow. So it could be that one day, you know, uh, five ounces of silver are, are the same as one ounce of gold, and maybe, you know, in, in the next year it's six ounces of silver or one ounce of gold, or four ounces of silver. You know, it's whatever the market would bear. Now the point about what happened in Europe, in, in, in the UK, when Winston Churchill brought uh, the UK after World War One, brought the UK back onto the gold standard, it did it at two, two owners in exchange rate, brought it back to 486, uh, 4 pounds 86 per ounce. It should have brought it back at, at more like uh, 10, you know, the 10 pound. Because of World War One inflation, all the major powers in the world, with the exception of the United States, which uh, got into the war very late, you know, in World War I. All the major powers printed money out, you know, like crazy, so that there was a huge money supply. So here, we, the Bank of England has the same amount of gold. Here's the, amount of, here's the pounds that it had at the beginning of the war. So there's a relationship. Well, now it's got the same amount of gold. Here's the pounds it has at the end of the year, or at the end of the war, and it tried to make the same exchange rate. So it, it forced all of Britain to go into this awful deflationary experience 
But it was difficult to do because of labor contracts. Of course, when the laborers don't want to be told, well, now we have to have the wages of the contract. So it was, uh, Churchill did not understand what that meant, and, and he, I'm sure that he got very bad advice. He should have brought Britain back at whatever exchange rate would be, this many pounds sterling in the economy, there's this much gold on deposit, there's an exact ratio, you can bring that back in this minute. Uh, just a really quick point there. Can I just finish up on, the, on another answer before we come on to what might be left under your bed? Time my mate's got Don't go there. <laughs> yeah, the other very, very quick point on the historical thing, and that is, um, uh, we were on the gold standard post Napoleonic War, so in 1816, um, uh, and uh, even could take that right out into the 1890s, and the price of a loaf of bread didn't move uh, a single penny. So we had a period of nearly uh, 80 odd years of absolutely no inflation whatsoever, uh, through a period of one of our strongest periods of growth in the United Kingdom industrially. Uh, so it, 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 it doesn't follow. Uh, you need the, you need the debased currency in order to increase uh, into, to increase the nation's wealth. Historically, that just simply doesn't work. Tell me what you mean. Well, I did the Mrs. Watanabe and Mrs. Lang. That's just the typical Japanese housewife and typical Chinese housewife are buying gold mines. I mean, they're not cool buying it. It's based in China. You probably mean you know they're. Hong Kong apparently was a three-day holiday, and uh, people flooded to Hong Kong, and the paper said it was, it was like a, a conquering horde as they worked their way up the street and cleaned out all the shops and all the gold, because gold is cheaper now than it has been for about two years. And uh, they recognize that things are not going the way they should. Um, there are many people in the world who have seen their entire wealth wiped out. And we know what can happen if we not hold something that of lasting value. Gold is of lasting value. And I have, I have, I do not follow you, but I have, I'm a multi trillionaire. One of my students, uh, two years ago, asked me if I wanted to get a cup of coffee with him. And when I did, he handed me an envelope and said, I want to pay you personally for what you taught me. So, in other words, a $100 trillion Zimbabwean bank that he bought for 10 cents on the evil. So, uh, that is what can happen to a currency. Sorry, uh, I just want to take a slightly different slant on, on, on what we've been discussing. Um, one of the things I've thought about when, in terms of finance, um, why not just do away with national currencies altogether and allow uh, in, independent private banks to issue their own currencies, and then the market decides which is the best place to do it. That, that way, at a stroke, I think it would kill the political influences and so on. I absolutely agree. Okay. <laughs> I absolutely agree. That the, in fact, many Austrian economists have said, really, the way to solve all of this is for the nations of the world to uh, scrap their legal tender ones. You can use what you want. You know, you can use Euro, you can, or you can use Jimmy, Hong Kong. Shanghai Bank is usually its own country. I kind of like that. I, I have more trust in that bank than I were in markets or, or something else than I have in, you know, in my own government money, which I think over time you would find that your government's money is probably the worst money because it's political money. Whereas commercial relations, people have to, they have to meet their obligations or go to jail in commercial relationships. How many times, how many politicians have gone to jail for debasing the money? Um, your colleague here, Michael, uh, and you were completely mentioned it earlier, you were speaking about China buying gold. I don't know if you are up to date with that, but it came to me as a surprise, so can you brief us on this, please? Oh, well, it's just been, it's been a paper for the last couple of days that uh, over the weekend, but it was a holiday, and um, I think it's that the Chinese private economy has purchased $300 billion dollars of in the last just in the last three years, and uh, wiped out all the gold shops in the major district of Hong Kong that sells all, sell gold. And it, I'm just pretty surprised throughout the paper. 
that is very close to common. I'm sure you can, you know, look, Google, uh, you know, Mrs. Mrs. Wayne Klein told me. Yeah, that's, that's, that's Max Tyson. There was also a trip, I worked in Hong Kong for a while, and there was a big tradition of buying gold there. You can buy that across the, uh, you know, you can go into a bank and you can, you can buy gold. Uh, and that's more simply than you can in London, you have to go to a point in Dino and fiddle around. You just get people going to their banks in, 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 in the Far East and just buy gold. And there is a feeling, there is a feeling with making short selling, but once the price gets down to under $1,500, that it's a buy. It's, it's a buy and it's stabilizing the price of $1,500. So you've got one street selling for gold uh, and you've got ordinary real people, albeit Mr. and Mrs. Wayne, uh, 22 please, but um, uh, they, uh, they are buying in very much in the traditional, in the traditional way. Uh, and I think that's going to put a floor in it. Uh, that's going to be sort of coming to the floor in the price of gold. Uh, and. Um, I think we're going to see more of that, and it's, there's been a theory around, there are so many millions and millions and millions of Chinese uh, that the Chinese middle class, which of course is growing and growing, would only need to buy each a very small quantity of gold, maybe half a troy ounce uh, each, to significantly move the price. Because you would be talking about hundreds and hundreds of thousands of troy ounces if they decided to go that route. I think uh, I don't think that's unlikely. And of course, you can't sell short forever. The market price has to arrive forever. So sooner or later, I think the music will stop. I think Wall Street's going to be badly caught out. And I think you'll find Tom Hooper in great prison. I think we'll find Jamie Diamond in prison. Mm -hmm. And if he isn't in prison, he certainly should be. Okay. Okay. I'm Daniel Richard, I work for a few benefits in the state from the European Parliament. Not a big one. And a couple of comments. First, uh, I'm from Finland, and when you talk about the next state, you know, joining again and going to go to And one problem is that the uh, ratio of the reserves in the US Central Bank is way lower than in the public bank. So that's for me an issue also. The general monetary soundness among the population does not exist. It's a debate between leftists, so probably not uh, politicians running the central bank or independent central bank. Um, another question uh, relates to the premiums when you talk about uh, buying physical and Chinese and so on. I've uh, read quite a bit about the premium spike in recent and you might be tell a bit about how the relates with the Asian and Russia. And the third point would like, um, if you're interested, to look at uh, Hans Werner Schilling versus George Soros, a debate article on the project syndicate, which addresses this uh, exact point about German currency appreciating his favorite leader. They don't even mention a gold standard. But one point he makes I don't know how much for you are in this sense, uh, it's about intervention, that the uh, German and Bundesbank should replace its worthless target credits when the currency appreciates by selling Deutschmark and that way getting real actual foreign assets on its books instead of worthless credits. To the so, good. <laughs> Well, that's why I said, you know, Finland might have turned from the Deutsche Bank. Uh, they could just turn it into euros and, and just adopt the Deutsche Bank. Uh, there are five, there are five independent countries in the world that use the dollar. They just dollar you know, They, they have the say in the federal monetary, in the federal reserve system. They just, you go to these countries, they just, you know, the dollar is their leading of exchange. They look to be a Deutsche Bank. Um, I think you know. I think we have to realize that right now the, the gold for gold is not a monetary medium as we that we use it. So there are a lot of funny things going on about you know selling short and trying to manipulate the, the market for gold and the spike in the price of gold. Uh, what we're talking about is establishing uh, gold as the as the basis of the monetary system. 
And at that point, then gold would have, would, its relationship with, with other goods and services would always fluctuate, meaning that prices would fluctuate, that they would fluctuate according to gold. However you define that gold, you might define it as a dollar, if you want, or it might define it as an HSBC dollar or something. But gold would be gold would become the monetary or silver to become the monetary. So uh, I forget if there are other questions you had there, but the country does not have to have a large supply of gold to have a sound currency. It, it, it can go on another sound currency. You can adopt another sound currency. And last thing about uh, replacing the work as target for right. something. Replacing the work as target for right. something real. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if the music system this works. Central bank intervention to repress the currency. I mean, it, it would be better than what we have today. But I, um, I was just uh, just today kind of refreshing myself as I drove the train over here from London. Um, there's a wonderful article by uh, Dr. Philip Bogus called "Passing the Bailout Buck." I'm not, it really doesn't explain what this article is, but if you go on, on Mises.com, U.S. M-I-S-E.com, and uh, click on Dr. Bogus, B-A-G-U-S, he has a lot of articles, but this one explains how the target two system works. And everything I've learned about how it works, I've learned from Dr. Bogus. Uh, I've met him personally, he's been brilliant, and, uh, and he admits in here that Germany is just receiving Piece of the paper, and you know, Germany, Germany is being, you know, taken to the cleaners by this target two system. Germany is accumulating massive amounts of worthless credits. They should not do that. I can use an analogy for those people who are only interested in Lehman and not particularly uh, sort of uh, economic amorites like Pat and I. Um, uh, that is, it's a little bit like going into a bar, running up tap. Uh, the barman's selling you, selling lots and lots of beer, loads of beer. It's looking like a really great party, and you're busy signing the tap, but you don't have any money. So at that stage, halfway through, everybody's feeling good, everybody's pissed. The barman thinks he's doing well, but the tabs he's sticking on the spike are actually valueless. And I'm afraid that's how the target system is working in Germany. They've got an awful lot of tabs on the spike, which will never be better. I think, you know, Germany, again, this just shows how Germany is the loser in all of this. You know, its export industries may think that they know this is a great thing. So, yeah, there's a segment of Germany that thinks this is a wonderful thing. But Germany as a whole are losers. I, I look at their, uh, Germany's, uh, the Bundesbank's uh, carbon to balance once a month. And the last time I looked at it was um, around 650 billion euros. That's a key monster. A credit never they want to be paid in real estate. You know, just, they may have to write it off. But write it off now before it gets to be 700 billion or 800 billion or a trillion. That's what we have to do. If all these countries are owing money and they're in debt, who are they actually owing it to? <laughs> Well, I think it's, I borrowed a hundred euros from you, and you borrowed a hundred euros from me, and we both went out and had a party, or we party with a hundred euros, and now we both walk each other later and we have to pay our utility bill and say, can I have a hundred euros back? It's gone. It's gone. You can say you owe it to yourself, but it's really gone. Yeah, you know, we have, we have consumed, we are consuming our capital. I hope you understand that. We are consuming our capital. So when we say, well, we owe it to ourselves, this is ridiculous, right? No. No. We are, we are owing it to ourselves and we're pretending that my son and my grandsons are going to, are going to work very hard and pay that back for them. Well, really? They can't work that way. They cannot. The debt is too hard. It just is not going to be hard. It's going to be, it's going to be default. The other option is, 
sure, I'll get my Social Security check, you know, in, in a couple of years. I go on Social Security, and that Social Security check will buy me some of the But they'll have me currency so worthless that that's not all we work. I mean, this is real. So I'm trying to get through to everyone here. This is the reality of where we stand. Don't be fooled by masses of pieces of paper and how the GDP is going up in the United States. It's, a, it's a nonsense. You, the GDP increase in the United States is nothing but printing money and then saying, I'm now counting all that extra money that I printed in the GDP. That's all it is. The United States. The United States has very high unemployment, but the government has changed how it accounts for that high unemployment, so it pretends it's an unemployment figure is coming back. So I don't, don't trust it. I don't trust a thing that comes out of the, out of the United States statistical office. Find out what's happening to your neighbor. You know, how many homes on your street have had been taken over by the bank. Then you'll find out how the United States is really So we're going to have a suicide pact for everybody. Well, thank you very much, Professor Barron. Jolly well done. It's been fascinating, as always, when you come over here, and I think we'll show our appreciation in a usual way.